All right, it is noon. Marcus, are you ready? I think I am, as long as you can see my screen and hear yeah. me. Well. Yeah. Uh, let me do a quick introduction and then we'll go ahead and get started. So for everyone that is not going to be on the webcast today, please go backstage. And to everyone who's joining us, thank you so much for joining us for this week's Anti-Siphon Anticast. We do this pretty much every single Wednesday at the same time, and we appreciate you being here. The Zoom platform is a little bit different, so if you're watching on Zoom, if you're not watching the recording, if you're not watching on YouTube, uh, then for you, uh, finding the join button and doing that verification. But you can always watch on YouTube, and you can always watch the recordings available on the Anti-Siphon YouTube channel. So we got Marcus here today. I got a chance to spend a little bit of time with Marcus in... Uh, in Deadwood, South Dakota, when we had Wallace Hackenfest, and he was teaching his class. And what I like, what I got from you is that it was good, like teaching in person again, teaching people again, like having that like opportunity to teach. Like it was a good experience for Marcus and for the students. And so Marcus is here today to give a free anti siphon anti cast on uh, Enterprise DFIR, DFIR investigation scenario. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask at any time during the webcast inside Zoom or in Discord. If you ask in Discord, your fellow attendees might be able to help answer the questions. Uh, but we've got Marcus here today. And Marcus, it's all yours. If you need anything at all, we'll be in the backstage uh, ready to help. I'll come find you there if needed. Sounds all good. Right. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thanks, Jason. Thanks, uh, Intersiphon team for having me again. Um, it's always a pleasure. It's always been, it's always fun to hang out with you, especially meeting so many people in Deadwood. So for anybody who has not been to a conference virtually or even on site, I highly recommend those. Um, but I'm here today, yeah, to talk a little bit about those topics that I've been um, um, talking about and teaching at uh, you know some of those anti-siphon events. Um, it's all about blue teams. So I'm uh, I'm Marcus Schober, and I do run a. Uh, the company called Blue Cape Security. And I founded the company myself because of uh, my passion for like teaching and showing people everything I've learned in my blue team career. And today we're going to talk about a very um, you know, broad topic. As you can see here, it's enterprise DFIR investigation scenario. So DF and IR stands for digital forensics and incident response. Those are some two terms that somehow got put together in a in the uh, event for like responding to cyber threats when you do investigations and also incident and handling incidents. So um, technically, two kind of different disciplines that just overlap a lot when you respond to cyber threats. And we'll talk about a scenario today because I feel like you know that's the best way to understand and teach and show people of how you would do things. And it's very practical. Um, I'm not really a fan of a lot of kind of. Um, no fluffy slides with lots of uh, theory and things along this. It's very practical, just walking through a scenario uh, based on best practices, lessons learned, everything that uh, might be useful to you when you experience uh, something like that. So thanks for joining. Yeah, and uh, we'll get it started. Now, first things first, though, um, as always, <laughs> there's always a disclaimer because we are technically tapping here into a field that is... Um, can be pretty critical, right? When you respond to incidents, um, there is a lot at stake. Sometimes you even, um, oftentimes you even have to seek legal advice. So anything you see in here, here, uh, please don't hold me liable for it. And also always talk to your lawyers. This is just also not just a formality here. Actually, this is uh, really what I wanted to point out is um, it's important to include your lawyers and your legal counsel or anybody uh, on, the, on, that, on that end to your um, investigations, to your preparations for your uh, in, uh, consult with them during those activities because there's a lot at stake and uh, a lot of that has to do with legal. So please always keep that in mind for sure. However, um, so why are we doing this presentation? I know um, I've always it's been always a pleasure to go to conferences, talk to people virtually. Um, you know, throughout my career, I've uh, seen a lot of people that have always been wondering about certain things uh, on how to do this, uh, how to do incident response and DFIR in a real world scenario. For some, you might have just taken some training, but you're wondering how to apply those skills. That happens a lot. For some, you don't know what skills you actually need in a real world scenario. So you might not even be the dedicated incident response person or work in a SOC. You might be a sysadmin, right? There's a lot of these people actually, sysadmins that have taken um, my the training workshop at that in that word, uh, that actually just were wondering of you know better do how how what you need to know in order to respond to cyber threats and attacks because they are kind of wearing all kinds of hats uh, in the cybersecurity department. They're basically the cybersecurity department. So 
Um, also an important and interesting question. Um, why are you looking to improve your process and procedures? How do other people, how do other organizations do those, right? That's the question that I've gotten a lot, especially throughout my career, uh, being a consultant, working with clients a lot. They always want to know how do other people do that? How do other organizations prepare? What do they have? Uh, how much people, technology do they have in place? How well are they doing? So that's another good one. Um, and then the last one, uh, there's always a, people that are working in SAR in a SARC or that have been, you know, that are waiting for anything exciting to do. Uh, luckily for the organization, they do not get to see anything exciting to do because there's no compromise happening, or at least not any that they would be aware of. Uh, but also that there doesn't really help you a lot to, you know, develop any skills, experience, right? You're kind of hitting a ceiling, um, closing out those mass amounts of alerts and tickets and phishing emails. You might be great at phishing investigations, but um, nothing really big is happening. And so how would you ever be able to expand your knowledge and your skills if you don't get to um, try and, and jump into the real world scenarios, cases, the big cases? Um, that happens a lot. So um, I'll just guide you through some of the, you know, uh, based on the scenario, best practices, and then also show you a couple of ways of how you can prepare yourself without even having to, you know, have your organization be on fire and kind of uh, responding to something uh, detrimental that might be going on in the cyberspace there. Okay. But first things first, I always like to start things off with um, this uh, particular slide because um, I want to set the stage. I want to make sure everybody's on the same page here. Uh, when we respond to cyber threats, then obviously nowadays um, ransomware attack is like the most, uh, the most, popular kind of uh, attack out there that people are preparing for because it's also very detrimental. It has huge impact to the organization. But um, there's also so many steps that are really well known um, along those lines, along the attack lifecycle um, that are really important to be familiar with because that allows us to better kind of expect better, better, better to make like better expectations and better response steps in terms of um, what are we seeing? Where do we think attackers are? And uh, what is the best way to mitigate and contain the threat? So, and this is the illustration that is uh, my former colleagues at IBM Security have laid out. And I think this is still a really, a really good one because it breaks up the steps and phases that make a lot of sense. So you'll see stage number one, initial access on the left-hand side. That has a lot to do why we're all getting slammed with phishing emails, right? Or as soon as there's a vulnerability that comes that goes comes out, um, the people those are getting exploited quickly. There's people that have nothing else to do than just trying to get initial access into organizations, mostly access, what they call access brokers, even trying to sell that access. They won't probably not even go any further. Oftentimes, they're just trying to get a foothold and uh, sell the access somewhere dark web. So initial access is what we or you probably are dealing with in your organization day to day, all the time, phishing emails. And sometimes people click on links and there might be a foothold and persistence and attackers are able to um, get a hold of the particular employee workstation. Um, usually that's not great, but as long as nothing crazy happens, no lateral movement, no uh, escalation of privileges or anything, um, that's kind of contained to a single single system, which happens a lot. But being familiar with the rest of the life cycle is important because as soon as you see something like stage two, like a post-exploitation foothold, that's where things might be getting a little bit more critical because that means probably a more advanced or sophisticated threat actor might have taken over and kind of deployed their own post-exploitation tools, very famously known as uh, Cobalt Strike or Empire, PowerShell Empire, or uh, lots of post-exploitation frameworks out there. Those are probably the most common ones. And as soon as you see those in your environment, you know uh, we're a little further down the line of the attack lifecycle already. And that's a, that's a the, the situation requires a little bit more urgency, of course, because that means that those tools are pretty powerful. These threat actors are usually a little bit more advanced. So what they do from there can uh, you know, go down pretty quickly, all the way leading into ransomware and data exfiltration, which we obviously try to want to avoid. Now we have the stage three, and um, that already means that you might there might be a compromise ongoing not even just contained with the, even just like, you know, taking place on a single system, but that already includes potentially lateral movement, enumeration of your network environment, of your systems, of your active directory. So to gather a list of domain admins and domain controllers, which is always a juicy target for threat actors, 
So there is probably when you when you detect activity like that, again, the context matters if you understand, oh, we are probably further down the line of the attack chain. Um, that requires more urgency. That might be that might uh, maybe even um, help uh, might make might there might be a justification to decide that you bring in like external consultants or additional help to help you uh, mitigate this this the, the threat and the issue there before things become worse. Where we when things are worse, obviously you know the target for threat actors is to monetize anything they can get. So data exfiltration, collection, exfiltration, and ransomware deployment of uh, the last few stages that you might find when a threat actor successfully goes through the entire, is able to go through the entire attack chain and achieve the objectives. Um, when you detect ex data exfiltration, um, that's already not great, obviously, and detecting ransomware, I mean, that's great, but at that point, things are a little late. So we try to obviously avoid and detect things way further down, the, uh, way earlier, and not all the way back when um, ransomware is there, because you can rest assured, threat actors usually try to notify you when they achieved their objectives and have deployed ransomware so that you, that you know how where to easily um, pay your uh, extortion fee and things along those lines. So basically important to keep this in mind, right? Whatever, whatever, whatever you come across, you kind of determines the urgency and the context matters a lot. So now let's uh, kick off our scenario. Um, so there's a bunch of ways that we could play this out, but um, just for some context so that we have a scenario that we can go through, we just talk about uh, an, an uncompromised employee workstation in this case, and we want to perform an incident response uh, exercise. So in this case, uh, what lots of organizations are dealing with, probably on a daily basis, if you're in a decent size, um, hopefully not too critical, but in this case, we have an alert. So we assume there is a... There's an employee that clicked on potentially some uh, some malicious software, um, and there is potentially an employee running on a Windows workstation, potentially dealing with sensitive data, potentially somebody in HR that always handles a lot of sensitive data, which you know also makes the scenario a little bit more interesting. And then um, we also assume that the alert came in because we are. Um, an organization that is lucky enough to have an EDR, an endpoint detection and response tooling uh, deployed. So the EDR notified us that there was a suspicious traffic to a particular domain. Now, this domain, you can look it up. This is something that you do not want to see in your environment, um, very likely. So um, this is just serving the purpose. It does, the context around it does not matter too much. But usually, this is how things happen a lot, right? If you work in a SOC environment, you see alerts a lot. You see people clicking on things. And then some malware typically, if there's an initial malware uh, attached to phishing emails, there might be some stages or so that if you click them, they reach out to a, uh, to a suspicious domain that, and then download additional payloads and uh, the stage two malware, for example. So this one just means we have an employee that clicked on something and also potentially a sensitive data that is uh, located on the system itself. So what? how do we respond? Now, we have to keep in mind when we're talking about the attack lifecycle, what's the lifecycle to respond? Probably a lot of people have seen this lifecycle before. So this one is the NIST incident response lifecycle, very famous. Don't want to spend too much time on just the theory around it, but um, you see a lot of response lifecycles out there. There's a bunch of different organizations or um, um uh, there's just the different variations of these uh, life cycles, but this is the most famous one. And it holds true all the time, right? It's a very simplified version, but it holds true. Like you prepare, you really want to be prepared so you can avoid as much as you as possible. And if something happens, then at least you're prepared to respond as effectively as possible. And to do so, we want, we first of all, obviously need to detect the threat. And then once we detect something, we need to analyze it to gather more information and to understand the context around it. Like I was saying earlier, this is already the part where we want to know where are we, where is the attack of down the road of the uh, attack lifecycle. So if we analyze, it might go through a couple of iterations because we can use the information, the outcome of analysis, and then use the uh, use that information for containment, right? We can then block the access, we can disable accounts, we can try to mitigate the risk as quickly as possible so that to, to prevent further damage. But oftentimes the full scope is not as clear and it takes many iterations and a couple days or weeks sometimes even to fully um, in, understand an entire compromise of a big organ of a large organization. So 
we kind of detect, we analyze, we contain, we find out more about the threat. We might go through more iterations of detection of analysis, containment, analysis, containment, until we finally are kind of um, in a good place where we can um, you know, remediate the issue. So we eradicate the threat active, um, clean the environment, recover from uh, good known states so that we can finally go back to operations and then um, perform our lessons learned, prepare um, and harden our environment, um, perform gap analysis, which we'll also talk about at the end of um, this session. But this is just a general life cycle that we want to keep in mind. And we want to, we will be following this throughout the scenario today. So there is um, first things first, right? We talked about the detection. Now, what happens if you get a, if you get an alert, like we talked about earlier? So we are not going to focus on the tactical response side. Um, now, at this point, we have your SOC analysts, most likely triaging those uh, initial notifications. So they have access to the EDR. They potentially, they're probably likely going to create a ticket for this. It's always very important to keep in mind that everything needs to have, you know, uh, needs to be in order. So you want to also make sure that there's coordination, that you have tickets, that you have the information captured in tickets, that you know who is who should have access to this information, when, how, where, and things along those lines. Something you do not want to figure out when it's when it's too late. But the most likely, also for low severity events, you probably just go through a ticketing system and then you document all the information that you can initially get, can get from your EDR. Uh, EDR often is pretty good when it comes to providing real-time information, um, not so much when it comes to historic information because EDRs only go back. The retention usually policy usually just goes back a couple of weeks. So anything that happened before that, you might be kind of out of luck uh, going through the EDR. So everything you can find, you probably just you know quickly document, ideally in a an incident response or ticketing solution that you have available. You have people that can act, have access to this. And then you start also creating ideally a an event timeline that helps to understand when something happened and where and how. It's because at the end of the day, you kind of, you know, you're always building this chronological order of what happened and when, who did what, when, where, how. And uh, that just helps um, to explain the entire uh, situation much better. And especially when it comes to collecting the information, there's IOCs, which are indicators of compromise. And it is also important to also maintain a list of your indicators of compromise. And there is a number of uh, different types of indicators compromise, right? They could be host-based, network-based, behavior-based. So it could be IP addresses, could be malware hashes, could be a particular commands, tools that a, a, an attacker might be using. Anything that helps us to understand the current situation better, the, the, that the attack should be documented because one thing that is often underestimated is we want to know the information, we can use it for our response, but also there might be additional teams or even partners or other companies or people that are just have a stake in this or might even have like, you know, trust relationship with us that also want to quickly be able to get a list of IOCs so that they can start searching their environment if there's effect, if they're affected as well. So it's not just us, you know, especially nowadays where it's supply chain and third parties and uh, that are affected oftentimes um, we want to be able to have something that's shareable, of course, with the blessing of legal counsel and so on, but just making sure that we have something that we can quickly share and also that's constantly evolving based on our analysis and findings. And then they can, everybody can use that and take action on that. But as soon as we have a detection and our um, information captured, what you do, if you do have your uh, quick, if you have your EDR system, for example, in place, um, you, know, you can perform a rapid analysis. Not everything immediately requires high severity um, escalation of a, uh, of the process of the problem. So we, first of all, you typically perform additional analysis and see what's going on there. As if you still have a host that's available and live online and you have EDR available, then you can easily obviously use the tools. Otherwise you might have other tools available that just can help you to understand what's going on at the moment on a particular host that might be affected. So you have, you look for running processes, you look for network connections, files that might've been created, users that might've locked on, um, any lateral movement uses uh, any 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 movement anything that like has locked has locked on on the system recently that might be suspicious or anything that actually 
was logging on from the system to somewhere else uh, uh, lately that would look suspicious and not like uh, the typical behavior. Um, so that's kind of the quick wins that you can find uh, depending on the tools. And uh, of course, a lot has to do with skills and how to, how to and knowing how to find the information and quickly grab, grab those information because that can help you a lot to better understand the scope of the incident. Now, if you have IOCs and if you have a tool like an EDR available, you can obviously then just search for those IOCs across your entire environment and enterprise-wide to better scope the uh, scenario, to better scope the incident. So seeing, hey, are there any other systems affected? Are there any other, are there any other people that might have clicked on this email? Or is there anywhere, any other systems that might show the same signs of infection uh, based on the IOCs that we know at this point, at least? There's a whole number of tools that you can use for that. And uh, obviously, scoping is very important to understand uh, what we're dealing with, uh, to, to understand what we're dealing with at this point. And that helps us to then, for a first iteration, to classify the incident, right? Many times it uh, can be a false positive as well. So um, it can happen that there's uh, obviously lots of alerts on an EDR um, that don't lead to anything, just, uh, just something that looked suspicious. And, um, and we might close out the ticket and uh, move on. But um, oftentimes, we've, I've also worked on cases before that led into ransomware. And initially, just because a, an analyst was, first of all, uh, closing out a ticket as false positive, which was a clear sign of that there was a threat actor in the environment already um, pretty far down the chain, so the attack chain. So uh, be careful with false positives. They can, that, that can be detrimental because um, you basically are done and move on with a ticket and you still kind of, um, you, know, you, you, you kind of just uh, left a, a threat actor in your environment uh, from there being able to go undetected. Now, if we find out the, the scope and the severity, we can, when it can attach a severity level to the uh, particular incident, you know, we might be dealing with a lower medium severity at this point. It might be a single system that might be contained. If you're further down the attack chain, obviously we might want to escalate the severity and the urgency to a higher critical incident because that would require us to escalate and pull in additional teams, additional help, and uh, kind of more, more, more firepower to respond to what we are dealing with at this point. And um, obviously, when we come when it comes to the compromised systems, um, if there is any data privacy implications, that quickly also might. Uh, might, there might be a general counsel or data privacy people needed to guide the investigation because that's a very important part as well. Just don't forget if a threat actor had a foothold or access to a particular system, do not forget about the context and what's on the system. How important is the system? What user accounts are on there? What documents are on there? Um, it's not always just the same. But this is, um, first of all, you know, a quick analysis, quick triage. We might now obviously uh, determine that this is uh, the, the scenario we're dealing with is uh, potentially something serious, so we need to further investigate it. So when we have a compromise, important, we might have to preserve the evidence in any potentially legal you know, follow-up activities, or we have to further perform further analysis, forensic analysis, further incident response, because the uh, issue might not be contained at this point. So let's move on with that. And we just talked about containment. So how can we contain the threat in the first place? A couple of things that we can keep in mind. Obviously, the affected workstations. We can isolate the affected workstations. Uh, we can also try to come up with uh, potentially affected user accounts or potentially user accounts that could have been compromised as, uh, as a result of, the, of a compromised workstation. So user accounts that might have logged onto the system, that have, you know, their credentials might have been still in memory, things along those lines. So this is something where we can perform quick containment and then respond those to those IOCs that we just developed. And when responding to those IOCs, um, that's uh, oftentimes a pretty critical phase because you want to be effective, right? You ideally you want to just respond to those IOCs, meaning that you block IP addresses and uh, eradicate certain malware, and then you lock out the attacker or the threat actor for once and all. But usually it's not that easy, especially in the beginning, especially when you don't understand the full scope of the compromise. So a couple of things that we need to keep in mind in this case, and that helps, and it helps a lot to keep, uh, to think about the pyramid of pain if uh, people haven't, if people are not familiar with it. Uh, this is a concept that's very interesting that 
um, a security researcher named David Bianco came up with a couple of years ago uh, when you, it comes to using IOCs. So the pyramid of pain is basically all about uh, detecting uh, the, the entire point is to detect indicators and to respond to them. And once you can respond to them quickly enough, you have denied the adversary the use of those indicators when they're attacking you. So uh, this diagram just shows the relationship between the types of indicators that you have at hand. And then you can all, and then also how much pain it will cause for the threat actor to change or to come get by that kind of um, that particular containment activity. So for example, if you're dealing with malware, you can swap, uh, an attacker can easily just create new malware um, and, uh, and, and, and change a bit and flip a bit and then the hash changes and that usually help is enough to get by past some common antivirus products, sometimes at least. Um, when it comes to IP addresses or if you block domains, that's a little harder, but certainly threat actors might have other IPs and domains available and quickly change the infrastructure to some extent to use different IPs and na domain names. So threat, you know, do you have usually have threat actors are, um, establishing persistence mechanisms on systems. So it might not be so obvious that if you just cut off an IP address, if you just deny access to a domain name, that the threat is contained. There is persistence mechanisms that constantly try to reach out to call home back to the attacker's infrastructure and change the configuration as well. So we need to be as effective as possible. So if you can find certain network or even tools, uh, network artifacts or tools, that's becoming more challenging, right? If you know a threat actor is using Cobol Strike and a certain TTP is so a behavior, something that they constantly are using, commands, for example, or tools that are constantly using, and behavior that is constantly happening as a, as a result of the attack activity, if you can prevent or block those, that makes it harder because then they are kind of out of uh, any options to, to continue with the attack. That just basically means that they would have to change an entire tool set, the infrastructure, or even people that are more familiar with uh, doing the same, achieving the same objectives in other ways. So it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Uh, not every IOC is the same. And certainly keeping this one in mind might help a little bit to make better, um, better, um, to better understand what, what it means to an attacker and how, how, how effectively we can uh, er uh, con contain an attack. Now we decided that we moved on, right? So we have the initial detection, we performed rapid analysis, we have some IOCs, we have contained, tried, attempted to contain the initial, uh, the threat actor based on the initial information, but we might maybe need to further and better understand what happened. Again, EDRs don't always go back in time as far as we want to, logs might not be available, certain things might not have been captured. That goes back to a, an important topic that I like to talk about a lot, which is visibility. Just um, telemetry, collecting logs, telemetry, and having visibility is the first step in any response activity or preparation, ideally, because it was, you can't detect what you can't see. But as soon as uh, you know, as we need go, need to go down deeper, we potentially have to perform a forensic analysis of a particular system, for example. So forensic analysis can be anything. Uh, basically, it can be log-based, can be host-based, uh, any information that you can grab. But in this case, we are dealing with a compromised workstation. So for the sake of the scenario, let's um, talk about the forensics process based on a compromised uh, workstation, a Windows workstation in our case. Now, one thing that is often uh, overlooked is that the forensics process actually just does not just, uh, doesn't just mean we perform analysis and that's about it. It actually contains a collection, examination of the data, then the analysis and then the reporting. So this is the full forensic life cycle as defined by NIST. And it makes a lot of sense because what's often underestimated is the complexity of data collection. So how do you actually get the, the data that you wanna analyze as part of a compromise? And that's a tough one oftentimes. And we'll talk about that a lot in the next few slides because to me, in my experience, there was always a, a really oftentimes a, a big problem because if we got in, if I get in there as a consultant, I would ask somebody, hey, can you capture an image of a particular system? Can you grab those logs? Can you provide me with a certain evidence or a certain certain data? It, oft, it is oftentimes more complicated than you think, right? There is so many different systems that are living in all kinds of infrastructures. And uh, many times 
uh, stakeholders don't even know, like, you know, who is responsible for what, who has access to those, to that information, who can perform the particular um, activities. So clearly something you need to, you want to figure out ahead of time. So collection, when it comes to collecting the information that we need, there's a couple of best practices. First of all, we need to be familiar with the order of volatility. So from least volatile, from most volatile to least volatile data is basically the, the, the order of how we collect data. That means data such as, and typically like with Windows systems, a typical Windows system, you have memory and you have a disk. And, and, and the information in the memory obviously is gone once you turn off a system, right? This is the kind of information oftentimes we want to collect before it's too late, right? You do not want to shut off, turn off your computer, turn off a system and lose the memory because there's a lot of in important information in there that we that might help us quickly uh, provide any findings regarding an attack that we wouldn't be able to do so uh, within like when we perform disk analysis, especially when you have, for example, um, you know, like uh, dynamic data such as network connections, open network connections, uh, things along those lines. Those are really, really helpful um, getting those out of a, of a live running system or of the memory. Then another consideration, obviously, chain of custody that depends on the case and that also might be guided by legal counsel. But don't forget that oftentimes it's required to document every single step of the way of how you collect and uh, perform data acquisition, because how you handle evidence might be critical in terms when it comes into, for example, legal actions and court. So it's important to keep that in mind. And that might also be something you have to uh, talk to with your, with your legal team, first of all. And then you verify integrity, right? When you when you collect data, best practice is that you generate hash values of the type of data, of the memory, for example, of disk images. So later on, when you distribute those uh, uh, the data, people can actually run hashes and also verify that the evidence that they are working with is in, uh, that integrity integrity is given. So there is no changes to the evidence made. They're working with a one-on-one -on -one copy of what was uh, initially acquired. So that's the best practices. But when it comes to an enterprise uh, response, uh, enterprise uh, compromise, oftentimes we have additional considerations. It's not always as easy as, as clean, clear cut as like there's one isolated Windows system and we need to perform an in-depth forensic analysis and come up with everything that happened on the system over the last two years. What we need is quick wins sometimes. And the quick wins here is um, when you when it comes to data collection is already like a big one because that can take it, take some time. But we need to make we need to find the, the the balance between how much data do we need and how much time do we have. So timeliness matters a lot when you pull data from 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 environments that you might not even have access to, and then you might see that there is potentially systems running that have like you know disk images and terabytes of size, um, and and then capturing that kind of uh, data and transferring the kind of data to potentially a different storage so that your analysts can download it from there and then process it from there. You can imagine this could potentially take many days. And when it comes to a threat actor active, being actively in, in your environment and about to maybe steal data or release ransomware, we do not want to sit and wait for data being processed for days. So um, that's why it's important to know what we want to collect. Um, oftentimes nowadays, obviously, you have physical hosts as well as virtual hosts. Now, if, with employees working from home, um, if you have certain tools available where you can virtually grab uh, data that you need from their systems, that's great. But if, this, if the system or maybe the workstation has been shut down, which a lot of employees do as soon as they see something scary going on on the systems, you have basically a computer that's turned, turned off and now sitting at an employee's home. So shipping or grab or getting those that kind of a system from their home is sometimes also can take it uh, some time you know you have to send it across the country maybe or other places so this is a big delay and the uh, question is if you can afford that um, otherwise if you have virtual hosts obviously you know there's other there's there's sometimes the question around for example cloud environments who even has access to those systems if you have cloud administrators and if you have security analysts, are your security analysts supposed to touch those systems running in the cloud? Do they even have ac accounts? Can they access that? Do they have uh, a process of how to quickly contain and quickly um, uh, acquire data from your cloud environments? Or um, 
do you need help from your cloud team that actually doesn't know or doesn't care about uh, the forensic process so much, but you need to quickly, I don't know, train them up or so to on how to grab data, what tools to use in order to acquire the data for you. And so those are the kind of processes that you want to think about ahead of time. But as those are the considerations that also can delay the data collection um, a lot. And this is something you want to absolutely avoid. But lastly, so type of information, it also depends, right? We are talking about that there might be systems that are in size of like, you know, they have terabytes of size and like disk storage and they have just, or some systems that you can't even turn off or that you can't really access. What do we actually need from this particular system? So in our case, I would say, do I really need the entire disk image and the memory image of the employee's workstation at this point? Or is there enough is there enough information for me if I just know what I need to grab from that particular uh, system? And then there's the two different types of uh, information that you can collect. You can do a live response collection, which means there's a live running system and you just build a collection of the artifacts that you need for further analysis. Obviously you need to know which ones those are. And there's a really, there's a few important ones and that's all something you know has to do with um, being familiar with um, Windows forensic analysis, for example. But uh, you can select, pick and choose, ideally, which artifacts you need to further investigate or analyze a system or artifacts from a system. And then there is uh, also the option of grabbing those full disk and memory images. We'll talk about both in the next slides, but this is the part where sometimes might be a little bit more complicated and also take some time. So um, you need to find the balance and figure out what's best, what's the best course of action depending on the situation at hand. Now, speaking of, um, of, of artifacts on a Windows system, so the fundamental sources of forensic evidence on a Windows system is uh, on a high level illustrated here. Let's see, so there you are. Uh, we have the memory and the disk image, right? So first of all, order of volatility dictates that we wanna look into options of how we potentially can acquire memory. And then if that's an option or if it's not an option, there's some artifacts on a system that we want really are important for forensic analysis um, which allows us to not have to grab the entire, acquire the entire disk, just by uh, acquiring the particular sets of artifacts, we, we can get us a long way. So first of all, every Windows system nowadays runs on a file system, and that's called the NT file system or NTFS. NTFS handles um, you know, file creation, modification, and things along those lines. So all the timestamps you see associated with a file on Windows system is basically handled by the NTFS. So there are some files regarding the NTFS that can also give us a lot of clues of when a file was created, or there's also some journaling going on, which uh, might help us with finding uh, evidence of files that might have even been deleted in, uh, already at this point. So there's a um, couple of files important to uh, consider for your data acquisition when um, when it when it comes to the to the file system. And then Windows obviously has uh, a number of also important. Um, files or databases that might give away a lot of information for us as a forensic analyst. So obviously the registry is just one big set of files that have a lot of data and configuration stored in there. And so it basically tracks a lot of what a user was doing or what the system was supposed to do or what is, is supposed to do. And all this information can give away a lot of clues of if a, an attacker was actually on a system or if a malware installed certain things. So. Grabbing registry usually is also a really high value target because that can give us a can give away a, a good amount of information for a forensic analyst. And then obviously Windows event logs. So those are highly valuable because they there's some event logs that actually store um, potentially security related information. So those are the ones that we want to be looking for. Those are usually the low hanging fruit and the quick wins grabbing event logs, looking for the events that we are familiar with, that we know that we typically look for when it comes to security investigation or security analysis. Um, that those are those are the, the first step, I would say, because those are least effort and a really big reward. And then there's a couple other Windows artifacts. As a forensic analyst, you might be familiar with those that actually also store a lot of information of um, about uh, evidence of execution, lateral movement, uh, things along those lines. But it's getting harder the further down you go, the more deeper you have to dig into a system. So if you have event logs available, and that might even be in your SIM, not even having to grab those uh, uh, artifacts from a system, even better. 
but oftentimes that still requires us to dive a little bit deeper into a, an analyzer system of manually. So this is this is a quick overview of um, how the data um, of the data, the considerations of data acquisition and the data we want to collect. So we talked about the two different types, right? We can collect full memory and disk images, or we can perform a live data collection. So live response data collection means from a system that is still online and running, uh, we, we would deploy a tool, collection tools, and then acquire and upload the forensic artifacts from live systems. And there's a, I think those are my favorite the rec favorite tools or the, rec the recommendations I have for you here that are on here. There is a tool from Crawl, which is called Cape, that helps that can actually um, make it really easy to just collect these kind of artifacts we just talked about earlier. It's really flexible. You just run it. It performs a. It basically uh, it, it 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 creates a triage collection on a particular system. It can even upload uh, the data uh, straight from there to particular cloud uh, environments and things along those lines. We'll show. It, we'll look into detail a little bit more details in the next slide, but a really helpful tool in that way. There's also a tool from Magnet called Magnet Response that actually helps to collect the live response data, such as the memory and some, um, and it also runs commands to capture current network connection, things along those lines, dumps those into files, can also do some system data. Uh, it's a great one that just came out this year, I think. And then there's also a tool called Velociraptor, which is now by Rapid7, which um, I've also put in as part of my training course that we've done at the Wildest Hacking Fest and also in the next upcoming sessions because it's just a very flexible and interesting tool that can help with response, but also data uh, data collection. So we'll look into that also in a section. So if you, if you look at the uh, illustration on the right, now the question is how can we get the data from several, for one or several hosts as quickly and easily as possible? The answer is we can uh, work with those tools uh, to make our lives easier. So the first one, the CAPE, is basically a way that um, that is a it provides a, there's a there's a graphical interface uh, provided for it, but it also has just a, a, a command line. Uh, to, uh, you can also just use it on the command line with a bunch of parameters, as you can see in the bottom, to run and collect the data. So on the on the top, you can see you basically just say what um, what's the target source where you want to collect data from. And then you just basically say where you want to store the data collection. And then on the target section in the middle is basically where you can very modular define of what you want to collect. So you can just say, hey, just grab me the event logs. Or, hey, just grab me the registry keys. Or hey, just grab me the NTFS, the MFT file from, from the NTFS, the MFT files, which is the master file table, for example, also a high value target. Or what you can also do is I've typed in CAPE there because what uh, comes up there is it shows a cape uh, as a cape triage as a compound package. So basically, that means there's also compound packages that include event logs and registry hives, and just like the most common um, artifacts at once. So if you look at the command line on the bottom within the window, um, it also it already shows us that the target is a cape triage package. So it's going to collect the um, the most industry, I guess, best, based on best practices, the most in the industry most famous uh, artifacts for us. And puts them into a file. And then even um, you can see also that there is a way to an option to upload those files and upload, upload the data, um, even to particular cloud environments if you want to. So um, there's a lot of, it's pretty flexible and that's a very a quick win and a really easy tool to use, um, command line or graphical version as well. Now, additionally, this tool on the right-hand side, which is um, grayed out at this point, this tool can not just collect the data, it, it can also be hooked up with tools that can automatically process the data. So if you think about it, for example, if you collect registry hives, you can run a module against the registry hive, which then generates a CSV data from there instead of having to collect the raw register or having to capture the raw registry hive or have to work with the raw registry the raw data uh, in the big to begin with. It can run tools like the Eric Zimmerman tools, the forensic tools from Eric Zimmerman. Um, out of the box, mostly, um, which you can just uh, apply as part of this collection process so that you end up with parsed data out of, right away. So this is an interesting option as well. Now, the second one I mentioned is uh, Magnet, because this is another one. Again, I'm not affiliated with any of those, but those are just really easy, quick wins, and those are free. 
to use. Um, so um, I just recommend, you know, those tools based on what I think works. Uh, and so this one helps to actually capture the RAM and some volatile data on top of it. Plus you can also add system files to the collection. Um, a really great tool, obviously it's built to make it easy to import to the uh, to the magnet tool suite. So this is a whole nother topic, but it's just an easy one to run as well. And then one of the, another, another option um, we love, we all love Velociraptor nowadays. Um, this is more of a, um, a, a server client based uh, a platform. So as you can see here, you have assets, which basically have agents running and they connect with the Velociraptor server. And then you have a web, you have a, you have a web interface on the server that you can log into, and then you can run anything against those assets, so like the, what they call hunts in Velociraptor. And so those hunts can be like uh, using forensics tools, like the Eric Zimmerman tools, like, you know, for example, run the registry parser against a number of assets and show me the results of that. So this is kind of like a little bit like an EDR, not quite, but um, it's it helps a lot with gaining, uh, getting a handle on your assets in your environment. And as part of that, what you can do is you can run hunts that actually run the tools like CAPE before. So what you can do is you can run CAPE across a number of agents, a number of assets actually through the agents at once and upload the data to CAPE. So a really quick win and an easy way to, for example, collect the data uh, quickly at scale, especially. So that's another one. And so this is what, you know, what's important when it comes to a, a bigger, a bigger kind of uh, breach, like that's big in scope. You usually don't have just one asset. You have multiple endpoints that are infected. We don't have time to go one-on-one -on -one through all of those. And some of them are kind of questionable where we are not sure uh, if they're compromised or not. So being able to quickly collect the data and um, parse data and quickly get a, like a handle on it is, uh, is important. So I often recommend just to you know, have either Velociraptor ready or rolled out to your uh, endpoints on your assets. And so you can just always kind of quickly um, dive in as an analyst, or you have at least the server infrastructure ready and deploy those agents when you need them at those systems where you want to grab data from or analyze or analyze them through the console. That's a, that's a pretty good uh, setup to be prepared with. And so again, two options of how you would be able to collect the data um, with Velociraptor. So you can do at scale, so you can run hunts and then just for example, execute CAPE on each of the agents. And that's a quick way to get all the, all the data. Or what you can also do, CAPE has the uh, option to create an offline collector. So that means you basically create a binary that you can customize yourself. So you can actually, in this case, on the right, uh, on the screenshot on the right, you can select what the offline collector is supposed to do. In this case, we might say, hey, actually just run the CAPE, CAPE files again. Uh, in, this case, in this example, collect certain artifacts and then CAPE would automatically create like a binary, like an exe file for you. And you could just hand this particular file to your administrators or anyone who then might be able to uh, run the tool on the system to collect the data offline. So you don't have to even have those agents on, on the system's life and running. So some of the really important and best, best practices in terms of like how to collect data. Now, the other option is you collect full disk and memory images. And there is a couple of caveats and considerations. And I just wanted to point those out because again, the Git data collection is such an important part. When it comes to virtual machines, first of all, you know, who has access to it and where are they located? If they're in the cloud, you wanna not you do not want to take a snapshot right away because uh, AWS and Azure, as far as the best of my knowledge at this point still, um, if you run if you create snapshots, you would lose the memory of, of those images. So if you have a VM running in the cloud. First, you need to think about how to acquire the memory before you then can take snapshots and turn those into disk images because otherwise this uh, memory would, would be gone. So really important consideration there. Other, otherwise, if you have hypervisor level access, for example, if you're using VMware, uh, vSphere or so, or things along those lines, that makes it really easy because all you need to do there is you take a snap, you click on take snapshot of a particular system and it creates flat files, right? It creates uh, memory, it creates fly files for memory and for disk. So you just basically grab the folder for the particular VM and your analysts can immediately work with that. You can actually, the memory is compatible to run it through volatility. 
those VMDK files that are representing the disk images can are compatible with most forensic images of uh, most forensic tools. So um, this is the preferred and easiest way to basically acquire data. And then secondly, if you have those physical systems, um, like I was saying earlier, sorry about that. Um, you, be, you need to think about how you run, uh, you get the memory from systems. So your tool of choice, but basically the system still has to be online and uh, running, ideally network contained if there's a threat, if it exposes a threat to the environment, but a way to run a tool on there to grab the um, memory. There's a couple of tools such as the FDK imager is an easy one. And then you can also think about how to create a disk image. So if the system is still online, you run FDK imager. If you the system is already offline, you could potentially just uh, extract the hard disk and then ship it to your uh, forensic analyst, and they can then either uh, they can then work with the hard disk even by acquiring the data through a write blocker, for example. So that would be um, certainly the more like forensically sound way to do things. But again, it depends on we're talking about enterprise response here. So there is a couple of different ways how you can do that. So there was a lot about the um, data acquisition. So you might see how important it is to me because if you do not, if you mess up on the collection part, you don't have anything to analyze. So very important. Now the forensic analysis process now, this is something that finally after all the collection and after all the examination, Wow, I see people really love the topic, so that's awesome. <laughs> it's great that uh, people now hopefully are taking this collection part seriously uh, because the analysis is something we can then do easily, right? Um, depends on experience, depends on skills, but now if we have collected the data, we can examine the, the data, we can then analyze using our tools of choice um, for Windows. There's a few ways to do that. And then you know, put those uh, those uh, findings and recommendations into a report. Or so if you're talking about enterprise, you might have several analysts uh, analyzing several endpoints or artifacts at the same time. So they all need to then be prepared to report in the in, in, in report the findings in the way that's compatible with your process. Oftentimes timelines, right? Every analyst would then, for example, create a timeline of their findings for a particular system. And as the investigation lead, you would take those timelines, merge those, and be able to tell the full story of it. So there's a there's a bunch of a, a bunch of ways how you would uh you would do that as if you know if you're dealing with a broader compromise and you have a, an entire team on this. But document and findings recommendations that is easily to process for the leads and also your executives, that's important. Now if you perform forensic analysis, I have a uh, a good recommendation that hopefully helps a lot of people, um, which is there is a, a cheat sheet, a practical Windows Forensics cheat sheet. So I have a course out there called Practical Windows Forensics. For free, you can find on GitHub, Blue Cape Security slash PWF, this cheat sheet that basically talk, uh, walks you through an entire um, forensic process of uh, for on a Windows system. So it, is, it talks about, as you can see here, how to collect data, from virtual environments, how to hash, how to deal with registry hives, where those registry hives are located, what kind of, um, those are like, I think four or five pages uh, of all of every step-by-step -step of how you would perform forensic analysis using free tools, mostly Eric Zimmerman tools, things along those lines on a Windows system. So um, cheat sheets are always helpful because nobody can remember all the places and everything um, on, a, on a Windows system and how to perform forensic analysis. Um, I think this is also somewhere in the resources on the Zoom here, so feel free to grab it from there. Now, where are we in the forensics process? <laughs> We've now acquired data, started the forensics process on the incident response lifecycle now. We might be able to contain even more so because we have learned more from our forensic analysis, hopefully. We might have found new systems that are affected. Now we go back to the analysis. Now we might have to analyze more. Now we have to, uh, uh, scope, uh, scope might broaden now. So further analysis required, further containment required until we finally, until we can eradicate and then finally be able to recover from the particular uh, incident and then take our lessons learned into post-incident activity. Um, couple of recommendations. So remediation or recovery. So basically, sorry about that. Somehow my slides keep, uh, 
jumping over, but um, for remediation, a couple of considerations. And this is really something that depends on the situation at hand, but obviously you want to re-image or issue new systems for those that have been affected. Reset all the affected user accounts if you can. You do not want to be in a situation where you have to rebuild your entire domain environment, uh, but that's sometimes ne necessary. Um, so reset user accounts, block those IOCs, update rules for monitoring. So, you know, you can always, um, it's also recommended to use threat intelligence to, to gather further information about your potential attacker and then be more effective in responding to those or even be able to find things. So for me, from my career, it's been really helpful before, like where we had threat intelligence support on a case because we came up with a malware, they were able to attribute it to a particular threat actor and we were able to better actually more effectively find more compromised systems and respond to that. So threat intelligence and then updating rules for monitoring and preventing further, further um, damage is important. If vulnerabilities are in place, obviously patch as quickly as you can and then um, continue increased monitoring and in the accounts on the systems and your environment because um, you can you can never be certain that an, uh, an attack has been entirely uh, contained and eradicated. So it definitely requires high alert for uh, the next couple of for the for the foreseeable future. Okay, finally, we have gone through the incident. We have responded to the incident. We have successfully uh, contained and eradicated the threat actor. So now, a couple of things, best practices that you see is, uh, for example. In terms of outcomes, um, different expectations. Very important as an analyst or as the technical lead there. In a case, always make sure that you know what the expectations are as an outcome of an incident. So you don't always have to write a forensic report. You don't always have to. Uh, sometimes it's required that you might you might have to follow up with legal cases. So it might be required to write an in-depth forensic report, um, expert witness testimonies, a couple of things depending on the case that might actually result. In where we might lead to as an outcome of a case, always be sure that you just know what the expectations are because those change a lot depending on the situation, the clients, the uh, direction given by general counsel. And then finally, sorry, this jumped over again. Once we do can go into a both postings and activity, we do our lessons learned. Um, obviously, uh, this is uh, this is an important step that sometimes gets a um, little neglected, I guess, but um, it helps to prepare, to better prepare and prevent future incidents. So please make sure to take some time to go through lessons learned. There's a lot that's on the line there. And especially when it comes to like, you know, how the team responded, right? Um, has has the, the processes that you need to look at that need to be improved? Are there any gaps or things along those lines? Um, Speaking of gaps, gap analysis, any security controls that we need to improve, risk assessment. Now, what's the risk with the newly introduced uh, uh, security controls or containment uh, monitoring or detection rules that we might have uh, rolled out? So there's a lot of uh, the, the, the environment has changed, right? So that's a good one. And then finally, um, evidence retention. What do you do with the data collected? You can't just throw it away right away. So to think about potential prosecution or regular, regulatory requirements. And um, I think I see Jason and Deb coming on. So that's kind of it, right? Are we yep. wrapping up here? Yeah, that that hour went by so fast. It really did. Uh, so the back, <laughs> well, okay. we're like in the back end. We're like, whoa, oh, oh, oh he's, he's wrapping <laughs> up. Shoot. But we heard you go like, finally. And I was like, yeah. finally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, questions I'm around as well anytime. So yeah. Yes. Let me know. Uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, like to hop into discord and see if there's any questions in there that you can like answer in your own, uh, mm -hmm. in your own time. Uh, so if you see like scroll through over the last hour, yeah. if you see a question you, you can respond to, feel free. For those of you that joined us today, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're not going to wrap up right now. I will ask you uh, if you had a question that did not get answered during the course of the webcast, please ask that question again. Cause sometimes the question you ask it and then it gets answered. And so mm -hmm. we don't want to just ask the same question that's already been answered. So thank you uh, for joining us. And then Marcus, I'm going to give you a chance to do some final thoughts and then we'll officially end the webcast and then we'll stick around for Q&A. All right. So sure. Marcus, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Yeah. Um, when it comes to thinking about the scenario and preparing for this, think about it as term, in terms of people, process, and technology. 
they all go hand in hand. Don't do not like neglect one on another, but it starts with the people because if people don't know what they do, you can't improve your processes. The best tools don't help if you don't know, have people that are not trained on it. So um, I'd rather have skilled people and cheap technology than the other way around. So um, always just, you know, think about uh, those three different kind of areas when it comes to preparation. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. And for those of you that joined us today live uh, or you're watching the recording, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we do these anti-siphon, anti-cast every single week. If you don't know what anti-siphon is, we're a training organization. So if you want to take training from Marcus or others who do this every single day, uh, except for the days that they're training, uh, mm -hmm. they take all of the things that they learn, they take all the things that they implement in their real world environment, and then they bring it to the classes. And it's hands-on training and it's affordable and it's good. All right. So if that, with that, we'll go ahead and officially end the webcast and then we'll head into a Q&A period uh, with people who still have questions based on the content. So we'll stick around for like five, 10 minutes. You got time, Marcus? Yes, I'll be around. All right. All right. So uh, Alan said, hi, Marcus. I noticed on the network diagram slide, there is no proxy. Not that that really will matter. What matters is if there is a proxy and if that is an authenticated proxy. Is this an effective mitigation defense for most malware? Uh, it's a pretty technical question. So the, the network diagram was just uh, to serve, you know, for the sake of the purpose of the scenario. So it was not really like an accurate kind of any, like by no means a secure environment uh, representing okay. anything along those lines. What I like about proxies um, from an analyst perspective is definitely the logs, right? So you can see, you can learn a lot from those logs because any go, anything goes through those proxy logs. And oftentimes network artifacts like firewall logs or proxy logs are not of not easily available. So that's certainly something uh, to consider, but I don't know. Um, I don't know how, if I'd say that this is an effective way to, to you know, um, block malware, things along those lines. I don't think it's sufficient. Okay. Uh, someone asked about your class. They said, uh, was, they were looking at your website. What's the difference between the blue team master program versus your two day ransomware in terms of the 10 modules besides for the one-on-one -on -one oh, aspect? Yeah. It's a good question. Um, so I do have a program where I work with people for like several weeks uh, together. Mm -hmm. And um, the two day ransomware training is basically like a two day condensed version of the highlights, I guess. Are you it especially focuses, ransomware especially focuses the training on carrying out your own ransomware attack for blue teamers. So it's not too sophisticated for red teamers, but for blue teamers, everything you need to know, and you can do hands-on attack on a lab environment. And um, that's that's one of the highlights. And then we talk about everything you need to know when it comes to the technical aspects of how this is possible. And then an entire second day of how you would analyze and respond to that. So it's just a two-day condensed version, I think. Okay. Uh, someone here said, with Velociraptor, do you usually analyze by deploying agents to the environment, or would you run by USB to collect and send because it might be blocked? Um, it's two very different approaches, if I understand it right. Right, like with, with USB, you have like a, somebody who needs to be physical around, physically around to like plug those in, and oftentimes those are blocked. So if you have Velociraptor, this is exactly one of those big problems that it's solving. You have remote access to. Um, to endpoints that have agents installed. So it's a great way to respond at scale. Uh, someone said, is there any plans to do a live process from beginning to end of an affected machine? Like come back, do a webcast that says, here's what I would do, like actually a, like a live demo session, or is that something you do in your class? It There is a, my forensic class that's out. There is literally like that. So we walk for 11 hours, I think we walk through a forensic response. So, so to we walk through a forensic investigation of a Windows system mm -hmm. that we first, actually, there's a PowerShell script that I created using Atomic Red Team. It actually simulates a compromised system. And from there, it's 11 hours of just responding and analyzing the system uh, start to finish. So um, it's all recorded on demand, yeah. Yeah. So can I call you sometime just to check my laptop, you know, see if something's <laughs> going on? And so, you can just, you do? Yeah. just put the last rep on there and I, I'll have access. <laughs> You're compromised and we have bigger issues. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I, I've heard that performing host analysis might jeopardize the admissibility of evidence it brought to court. How often is this a concern? Yeah, um, again, I can't really speak to the legal kind of side of things too much, but it is, yes. Anything you run on a system after an attack has happened 
it is uh, potentially tampering with evidence, right? So you're kind of changing files and things, anything that you plug in there, anything you run, execute. The most, the cleanest way possible is obviously if you have the chance, if it's a virtual system, you pause or you suspend the system and you have those one, -on -one, one by one, like flat files, the memory for memory and disk images, that's a clean way to do it. Um, preserving memory otherwise is hard. Um, but if it comes to legal cases, right, you, you even sometimes goes as far as where you have to send a laptop or a system to a forensic uh, analyst, which then needs, who, who needs to extract the disk, the disk from the system, use a write blocker to just create a, like a forensically sound one-on-one -on -one copy of the disk image. Um, it really depends on the use case. Uh, have you ever played backdoors and breaches? I have, yes, just okay. once a long time ago, but All it because right. it tried to actually come up with it in our um my previous team that I was running at uh IBM security. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels I like, like we it. Should, yeah, it feels like we should have you on like a live backdoors and breaches yeah. session yeah. uh where yeah. we do that scenario and have you be one of the players. <laughs> yeah. And then uh that way you can just go through and be like, well, uh and then that way we can see like your, yeah. your process of how you do that. I love the con I love the concept. Yeah, I tried to introduce this to my team, but then real cases kept coming up. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we could do this fake one, or we could do yeah. you know, all these real ones. Right? It was a hard decision to make, but uh... <laughs> uh Marcus, I have a personal question for you. Uh what? why why do you like to teach? Um I guess it's just passion. I like to run when I was running my own team and everything. I just like to have people on there that I just could show around everything that I've learned, I've done that worked for me to make it more successful and like have them like ideally prevent from all the struggles that uh, come with this. So mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, I was not like, I'm not born like a, as a teacher or anything. I just want to show what I've learned. I think that's mostly my passion. And, and do you ever like have to, overcome imposter syndrome or is that not an issue for you like yes for sure it's it is a thing but then i always try to just uh go back to roots and think like hey i've done this in the real world so how would i've done it there and mm -hmm. like, there's not really right or wrong it's just hey this is how it happened people might agree or disagree it's just uh, one way of how i saw how i saw things and there's always people and that's kind of along those lines right Keep in mind, there's always people that want to be there where you where you are currently at. What you have to share is is interesting to others that want to get there, that want to see those things. So no matter how entry level or advanced you are, there's always somebody who is interested. So um, yeah, but I have to remind myself sometimes too, because obviously there's nowadays with social media, there's a lot of content that's being shared, a lot of stuff out there where I just sometimes need to force myself to not look at that stuff too much because it would just be a dis distraction, I think. Yeah. Uh, if any of you are interested in teaching, uh, first of all, teach. Uh, you don't have to impress everyone. Uh, yeah. You don't have to reach everyone. Uh, but if you reach one person and you see that one person's like light bulb just go off and then from there they run with it. And so if you're ever interested in teaching in the anti-siphon, feel free to reach out to us either through Discord uh, or info at anti-siphontraining.com because we're looking for more teachers. And we need you. Not like we don't need you. Like the like that the community you know, needs you. Yeah. yeah. Like we don't need you. Uh we want you. But the community yeah. yes. may need the thing that you have in your mm -hmm. head and the way that you're going to present it and the way that you're going to share it. Like Marcus did today. Like Marcus, we got your perspective on this topic. And right. and you're coming at it from your background and your history. And you taught it the way that you would teach it today. And other people would teach it differently because of their background, their history. So mm -hmm. uh Marcus, I think we're out of questions. Uh, and so that is it. If you can go through Discord, if you see anything in Discord, when you have time and mm -hmm. respond to people's questions that way. Uh, if you're on Discord, thank you so much. If this was your first time on an anti-siphon anti-cast and you're in Discord, just go ahead and say the word first for us. So that way we know you're here for the first time. My name is Jason Blanchard. I don't think I mentioned that. Uh, I'm the content community person here at Anti-Siphon, along with Deb, who's our community person here at Anti-Siphon. And we got Marcus, who taught us all the things today. I think that's it. Ryan, it's it's time, Ryan. Kill it with fire, Ryan. Kill it. Kill it. Kill it. Ryan, kill it with fire.